All right, students, we have been studying the topic of chemical kinetics. We've studied rate expressions and how to measure the rate of a chemical reaction. We have studied about rate laws and how to experimentally determine the rate law and the rate constant for a chemical reaction. We proposed a theory, a model for how reactions happen. We call it collision theory, and it takes into account activation energy and the orientation of molecules as they collide. And now we're ready to bring it all together into the proposal of reaction mechanisms. And this will be our fourth and final set of lectures in this unit. So hope you enjoy it and uh, let's go. When we are trying to describe the process by which a reaction might happen, what we can do is we have, you can have the overall progress of the chemical reaction represented at the molecular level by a series of simple elementary steps or elementary reactions. Generally, when you describe a chemical reaction with an equation, you list all the reactant molecules and then all the product molecules. But having understood collision theory, and the need for molecules to collide, we realize that the probability of more than three molecules colliding at the same instant with the proper orientation and sufficient energy to overcome the activation energy barrier, it's going to be a very, very low probability. So what happens is that most reactions occur in a series of small reactions that involve one, two, or at most, three molecules colliding. So each one of these is what we call an elementary step or elementary reaction. So a reaction mechanism is essentially a sequence of elementary steps that leads to product formation. Let's consider the following reaction between nitrogen monoxide and oxygen gas to produce nitrogen dioxide. Now, when we study the chemical reaction, something interesting happens. During the reaction progress, the substance N2O2 dinitrogen dioxide is detected during that reaction. And so what scientists do is they make the following proposal. They're going to say that the reaction occurs in two steps. In step number one, two molecules of nitrogen monoxide collide to produce this substance, N2O2. In the second step, N2O2 reacts with oxygen to produce the two molecules of NO2. Notice that if we add these two reactions, just like in any algebra set of equations, the product of the first reaction cancels out with a reactant in the second reaction. So when you add them up, notice that you obtain this. You have two molecules of NO, one of O2, and the product is two molecules of NO2, which is exactly the chemical reaction that we had. So this is essentially how a reaction mechanism works. We propose several elementary steps that involve uh, collisions between molecules. All right, it helps maybe if we can see this as a representation in using, I'm sorry, using molecular models. So let's look at the first step of this mechanism. In this step, two molecules of NO are going to react to produce N2O2. In the second step, that molecule of N2O2 that was produced in the first step now reacts with oxygen to produce the two molecules of NO2. Notice that this first step here essentially involves a collision between these two molecules and notice that they are in the right orientation for the two atoms of nitrogen to collide and become joined to each other. 
In a similar way, you can see how in the second step, the N2O2 collides with the oxygen molecule in exactly the right orientation for the oxygen molecules to collide and uh, form this new product, which is the NO2. Notice that each one of these represents a single collision event. And that essentially is what an elementary step tries to represent. It represents a single collision event. So let's look at it in more detail now. First of all, what about this N2O2 molecule that was produced in the first step and then was reacted and in, in the second step? Well, this is what we call an intermediate. Intermediates are species that appear in a reaction mechanism, but not in the overall balanced equation. And the way you distinguish them, the way you identify them, is because an intermediate is formed in an early elementary step and consumed in a later elementary step. So, for example, when we built that mechanism for this reaction, we notice that the N2O2 is produced in the first step, but then it's consumed in the second step. And as we add the two elementary steps, <clears throat> those two species essentially cancel out and no longer show up in the balanced equation. Remember that we said that an elementary step essentially is a single collision event between molecules. So we can define what is called the molecularity of the reaction. That is, the number of molecules reacting in an elementary step. We can define some of these as being unimolecular. This is an elementary step with one molecule only. So one molecule by itself kind of like explodes or implodes and produces a product. Uh, usually these types of elementary steps occur when you have unusually big or complex or unstable molecules that will sort of like fall apart readily. We also have bimolecular reactions. This is an elementary step in which two molecules collide, such as this animation you see here, A and B collide, boom, and they produce the product, right? I think based on what we studied before about uh, collision theory, we would expect that a large number of elementary steps are going to be typically bimolecular reactions. There's also a termolecular reaction, an elementary step with three molecules, as we see in this illustration here, A, B, and C collide to give us the product. This is not a very common type of reaction. There are very few of them known, actually. Uh, one reaction that's been proposed to be like this is uh, reactions that happen in the high atmosphere involving oxygen, ozone, and nitrogen. And it has been proposed that some of those might be termolecular. But as you can imagine, it's not easy to imagine, to, to uh, envision you know, three molecules colliding at the same time in the proper orientation. So let's look at the rate laws. Because it turns out that in a uh, <clears throat> Elementary step, we can actually write a red law directly from the equation of that step. So for an unimolecular reaction, A, converted to products, we can write the rate law for that step as a rate constant times the concentration of A. Now, remember, this works for the elementary step. It doesn't work for the overall reaction. So if I had a reaction A being converted to product of B plus C plus D, I cannot assume that just because I have one reactant and the stoichiometric coefficient of it is one, that it rate law is going to be K times the molarity of that reactant. 
This is only valid for an elementary step. All right, let's look at a bimolecular reaction. Well, we have two possibilities. One of them is two different reactants colliding to make products in that step, and we can write the rate law as K times the concentration of A times the concentration of B. Again, remember, this is not for an overall reaction. This is for a single elementary step, a single collision event. Now, a bimolecular reaction could involve two reactants of the same kind. So A reacting with A to get products. The rate law for that would be K times the concentration of A squared. Now, here's the important thing. In writing a plausible reaction mechanism, we have to take into account uh, several important things. Let's call them rules. First, the sum of the elementary steps must give the overall balanced equation for the reaction. If you write out the steps, and the total result of the adding of those steps does not give you the overall balanced equation, that mechanism does not work. The other important thing is, there is in your mechanism something called the rate determining step. And that rate determining step should predict the same rate law that is determined experimentally. In other words, the rate of the reaction depends on the rate law of that specific step that we call the rate determining step. The rate determining step is the slowest step in the sequence of steps leading to product formation. Let me give you an analogy. Like many of you, I shop at Costco. Now, I've been shopping at the same Costco store for many, many years. I know where everything is. So when I walk in, I know exactly where the things are that I need to find, and I can essentially zoom straight to the aisle where that stuff is, and it takes me just a few minutes to get the stuff that I need. So having saved all that time, I happily carry my shopping cart to the uh, you know checkout line, and what do I find? Bah! Tremendous traffic jam at the checkout, uh, at the cash registers. And so, yeah, it took me 10 minutes to get my stuff, and that's going to take me maybe half an hour just to get through the checkout line. That was the slow step in the process. Now, sometimes I'll get to the store and look and see that, hey, it doesn't look too bad. There's maybe one, maybe two customers per uh, checkout line. So, hey, everything should be smooth. So I zoom to my aisle to find my stuff, and guess what? They changed it. They switched the things around, and now instead of what I was looking for, I'm in an aisle that has, I don't know, cereals and breads and a lot of people in it. So now I'm going to have to go aisle by aisle until I can find the proper, uh, you know, the proper stuff. And so even though the checkout lines were short and it was going to be fast, it takes me longer to get there because now the slow step was finding my items. So I guess the moral of the story is online shopping, anyone? All right, so here is how we're going to be studying a reaction mechanism, all right? We're going to have several steps. First, we're going to have to measure the rate of a reaction. We studied this in our first set of lectures. What are some of the methods for studying the rate of a reaction? And then, just like we saw in the second set of uh, lectures in our class, in our unit, we then have to experimentally find what is the rate law for the overall reaction. Now, we are going to be able to postulate a reasonable reaction mechanism. Remember, in our reaction mechanism, there must be a rate determining step, a step that is considerably slower than the other ones, and the rate law for that step should match the rate law for the overall reaction. 
Let's do a little practice exercise here. The experimental rate law for the reaction between NO2 and CO, nitrogen dioxide and carbon monoxide, to produce nitrogen monoxide and carbon dioxide is this. Rate equals K times the molarity of NO2 squared. Okay, so the overall reaction is second order with respect to NO2 and zero order with respect to CO. In other words, the reaction rate does not depend on the concentration of carbon monoxide. So the reaction is believed to occur via two steps. Step one, NO2 plus NO2 collide to give us NO plus NO3. In step number two, NO3 collides with carbon monoxide to give us the product NO2 plus CO2. Now, what is the equation for the overall reaction? Remember, you treat them as if they were equations in algebra. You add them, and anything that is on both sides of the equations gets canceled out. So let's see what gets canceled out here. Okay, so we can see that one of the NO2s is present both in reactants and products. We cancel that out. And we see that the NO3 produced in the first step uh, cancels with the NO3 reacting in the second step. So now we add them up and the equation we get is NO2 plus CO yielding NO plus CO2. You can see where that is balanced in nitrogens, carbons, and in oxygens. That is the equation. Okay, so as far as that is concerned, the reaction mechanism works because it yields the overall reaction equation. Second question, what is the intermediate? Well, remember, an intermediate will be a substance that is produced in an early step and then consumed in a later step. So what do you think that is? Pause your video and think. We'll come back for the answer. Yes, the answer is NO3. Nitrogen trioxide here is an intermediate produced in the first step, consumed in the second step. Okay, let's now talk about rates. What would you say, what can you say about the relative rates of steps one and two? Okay, remember what is the rate law for this equation? It's over here. K times the square of NO2. Notice that the first step has two molecules of NO2 colliding. And therefore, step one has a rate law that is K times NO2 squared, just for that step. Since that is the rate law for step one, and that matches the rate law for the overall reaction, that must mean that step one is the rate determining step. In other words, Step one must be slower than step two. Okay. All right. When we come back, we're going to study an interesting subject. We're going to be talking about one. First of all, what are some ways that we can prove that we can give validation to a proposed mechanism? And then we're going to talk about a very special actor in the rates of reactions that we mentioned earlier but we haven't discussed, and it is catalysts. Okay, we'll see you soon.